With The Ring Sets Out and The Ring Goes South, it's pretty easy to treat them as two separate books. Indeed, I would say that it's necessary for many to not simply give up halfway through The Fellowship of the Ring. However, with the two books that comprise The Two Towers, The Treason of Isengard, and The Ring Goes East, demarcation becomes somewhat trickier. If you've seen The Two Towers film, you're probably expecting these books to operate under a similar narrative format, where the three splinter parties of the Fellowship are all undergoing their own journey simultaneously. When a scene with one group ends, a scene with another group begins, and there's the sense of constant forward motion. With The Treason of Isengard and The Ring Goes East, though, Tolkien chooses a different tactic. If the Jackson film is three tapes running simultaneously, Tolkien's Two Towers is one tape playing, then rewinding, then replaying from a different perspective, then rewinding, and so on and so on. It's a different type of format that requires a different type of preparedness for newcomers to not get lost or caught off guard. So how does The Treason of Isengard compare to its film counterpart? Well, first let's ask, what is The Treason of Isengard? Boromir is slain! Orcs have killed him and taken Merry and Pippin, and with Sam and Frodo gone and Gandalf presumed dead, Aragorn begins to fall into despair. Maybe everyone's faith in him was misplaced, and he has no power to save anyone after all. But as Aragorn struggles to maintain his resolve, Merry and Pippin become entangled with an ancient power. And while Sauron remains just as distant and undefeatable as ever, this power may have the key to defeating his trusted lieutenant, Saruman. The Fellowship may be broken, but all their paths are leading to a final confrontation with the White Wizard. How does the world of the Treason of Isengard work? Okay, so once again, I am not going to use this section for the basic world-building aspects of Middle-earth, because I assume everyone is already familiar with that, but instead focus on world-building elements that stood out or were surprising to me. One of the biggest consequences of the different narrative structure between the Two Towers film and book is the climaxes. In the film, Jackson ties together the Battle of Helm's Deep and the destruction of Isengard. This makes sense when the focus of the film is our heroes and their respective journeys, but in The Treason of Isengard, the focus is on Saruman. Even though we follow Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Merry, Pippin, and Gandalf, their journeys all lead to Saruman. So, if you're expecting the two big battles from the movie and the book, I'm afraid like me, you'll be somewhat disappointed. So many little moments of personality in Helm's Deep, like the box joke or Gimli being tossed, simply aren't in the book. And the destruction of Isengard is a mere prelude to the real climax, when Gandalf and Saruman face off. If you're expecting some epic battle between wizards, though, I'm afraid you will still be somewhat disappointed. Gandalf and Saruman do exchange magical blows, but it's mostly through Saruman trying to glamour the Rohan army and Gandalf into letting him go. It's sort of odd, because I found this scene to be easily my favourite part of the Treason of Isengard, while also feeling strangely anticlimactic? Uh, did anyone else feel this way? Please let me know in the comments down below. This is the book where we finally meet orcs, and they're all pretty evil. The fact that they have names, ranks, and individual personalities humanizes them in a way you don't see in the films or various other mooks across a lot of fantasy fiction, but honestly, this kind of makes things worse. If you've seen other videos where I talk about the subject, then you know that I hate the idea of evil races. Beings that are sentient but consigned in the narrative to being mindless brutes or savage hordes that exist in the story solely as enemies for our heroes to mow down. It's lazy, reductive, and in some cases outright racist. But the thing about Tolkien is that he doesn't even fully commit to this. If you want to fully dehumanize a group, you need to make individual members seem disposable. We don't care if a Dalek dies because there are 20 more where it came from, each with barely any distinguishing features. And we know that Daleks exist solely to carry out their function of exterminating anything that isn't a Dalek not even capable of ordinary human things like eating, sleeping, or making babies. So even when they die, our heroes don't need to have the idea of a grieving family on their conscience. The orcs, though, are shown to have their own distinct nationalities, dialects, and interpersonal relationships. Indeed, Merry and Pippin escape capture precisely because of conflict between these distinctions. But regardless of whatever distinctions might exist, 
The riders of Rohan kill every last orc because at the end of the day, an orc is an orc, and orcs are evil, and therefore it is no evil thing to kill them all. Even despite Tolkien's humanization of orcs, the story role they play is still to be disposable forces of evil that our heroes must destroy. Which leads to a new problem, and the question, what does the treason of Isengard have to say? In the last Tolkien video, I mentioned how it felt like there was a conflict between Tolkien's own values and beliefs and the narrative conventions of the Norse sagas which he took inspiration from. With Helm's Deep, it felt like those contradictions reached a breaking point. Like Tolkien was trying to write an epic battle for our heroes to vanquish their foes and attain glory, while also trying to write a somber reflection on how war is bad and good men die and we shouldn't glorify such violence. The heroes will spend one moment wearily hoping for sunrise to come, and then the next moment gleefully comparing their orc kill counts. It's schizophrenic, and admittedly this schizophrenia is one that many soldiers face, and what leads to a lot of cases of shell shock. It's a contradiction baked into the nature of an army. But even so, the narrative doesn't do anything to correct or contradict the hero's dehumanization of the enemy. We never get to see the conflict from the orc's side, we never have a human reflect how, in the end, the orcs are just soldiers too, and indeed, in the destruction of Isengard, while the Ents allow the humans to flee to safety, no such favor is extended to the orcs, with Pippin casually remarking how they probably all died. Again, I should note that this outlook on war and enemy forces isn't uncommon in many real-world soldiers. And given how Middle-earth, like all fantasy worlds, is a romantic distillation of Tolkien's own values and beliefs, it makes sense for his world to operate under these principles. But it's also very much a your mileage may vary situation in terms of how well you, the reader, relate to this outlook. I myself find it disappointing precisely because Tolkien puts in more effort into humanizing orcs than your average fantasy author before changing his mind at the last minute, but you may think differently. Another thing I simply didn't click with was the emotional payoff of Helm's Deep. In both the film and the book, the soldiers in Helm's Deep have to hold out against the orcs until sunrise, when a final push of their forces and the arrival of reinforcements finally routes Saruman's army. The central figure and focus for this scene is different in the film and the book, though. In the film, the focus is on Gandalf, and the payoff is that our friend has come! He made it! Our faith in him has been rewarded! But in the book, the focus is on Theoden, and the payoff is that the rightful king rides forth into battle. Honor and glory is his. Our breasts are not so timorous, nor are our hearts so weak. The book's focus is one that makes perfect sense for a Norse saga or bardic song, but which simply didn't resonate with me. I am not a royalist. I don't put stock in things like royal lineage or divine right, and so with regards to the scene, I. I kind of like the movie version better. Shame, 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 bad shame, vampire, shame. The more I read the original books, the more convinced I become that Peter Jackson's films are simply what the story would look like if it had been written 50 years later, taking into account shifting ideas of what to expect from the genre and shifting values of the target audience. One aspect which I do think Tolkien deserves praise for though, and an element I think all writers of trilogies could learn from, is his use of doubt. Isengard involves several characters, in particular Aragorn, being plagued by doubt. And it's easy to see why. Aragorn is supposed to be the leader of the Fellowship, and the true King of Gondor. But with so much of that Fellowship dead, captured, or disappeared, Aragorn begins to wonder if he's even worth the faith people put into him. Uh, something else you should know about the structure differing between the books and the films. And The Ring Goes South, the final scene focuses on Sam joining Frodo in his flight, with Boromir's fight against the orcs and Merry and Pippin's capture taking place off-camera at the beginning of The Treason of Isengard. In terms of plot, I think I prefer the film version, where these events all occur simultaneously, because it gives us a big battle to serve as the climax. But in terms of theme, I actually prefer the book version. Not because of the events themselves, but in how Aragorn reacts to them. In the films, Aragorn is of course upset by the dissolution of the Fellowship, but he calmly accepts it as fate taking its course, before quickly choosing to go rescue Merry and Pippin, giving a rousing, let's hunt some orc, to Legolas and Gimli before they charge after their friends. 
In the book, though, Aragorn grapples with the question of what to do much longer, and this instance of doubt is repeated throughout the book. Aragorn doubts his leadership after losing so many companions. Ethedon doubts his abilities as a king, which lets him fall prey to Wormtongue. The soldiers at Helm's Deep doubt they can defend it even as they prepare. And even Saruman's last stand is focused on sowing doubt in Theoden and Gandalf. This doubt keeps popping up throughout the Treason of Isengard, but in all cases, faith is rewarded even as doubt tears at it, and the book ends with our hero's resolve strengthened. If The Ring Sets Out is about a new shadow overtaking Middle-earth, and The Ring Goes South is about that shadow being identified, The Treason of Isengard is about the heroes grappling with what to do after fully learning what that shadow is. I think this is a wonderful aspect of the book, because while the first act of a trilogy is about build-up, and the third act is about payoff, the second act doesn't really have much to do on its own. It's the most reliant on the first and third acts, and it's usually where a trilogy falls prey to slog or aimless wandering. But by having the characters experience doubt, and by giving them a smaller conflict to resolve without resolving the overarching conflict, Tolkien keeps the stakes up even in the middle portion of his story. And I love it for that. Final Verdict This book's woman count totals at one! This is the book where Eowyn shows up, and honestly, I'm kind of disappointed. I like that she gets to sit on the throne while Theoden goes to Helm's Deep, but as a character, she doesn't really do much beyond make goo goo eyes at Aragorn. So, a mixed bag, I guess? As for the book itself, I feel conflicted. There are bits that I prefer from the book, and bits that I prefer from the film, and while I still want to read the rest of the story, this is the first time where I felt truly frustrated with the book. But Tolkien's prose is still beautiful, and there's enough engaging content to make me give The Treason of Isengard a 7 out of 10, but as it stands, this is my least favorite part of the Lord of the Rings saga. Admittedly, that's not saying much, but I hope the remaining installments can recapture the magic. In the meantime, I'm Marco Keen, signing off, and I hope you liked this video. If you did, and you'd like to see me make more, please leave a like or comment down below, share my video via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or other means, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you all, and I will see you in the next one.